Hi, my name's Dave Bookless, and this talk is called The Big Picture. I want to begin by taking you to Nairobi in Kenya, where I was some years ago looking out and in front of me was a wall with written on it in letters probably two meters high, the words, Jesus Christ is the Lord. And my friend who was with me was explaining to me that this is not unusual in Nairobi and in Kenya at all where somewhere between 70 and 80% of the population attend church on a regular basis. It's an amazingly Christian country. And yet my friend was explaining to me that there is a problem. And it's a problem perhaps originally caused by some of the missionaries who came and preached in Kenya, and it's been carried on by pastors there today. And that's that the gospel that is preached is too small. People come to church, they hear the good news about Jesus, they repent, they're baptised, and they believe that then they've got a ticket to heaven. But it doesn't seem to make much difference to the rest of their lives. And as my friend explained this, it's as if the lens pulled out from that wall and we could see a view of the whole of Nairobi in front of us. We could see massive tower blocks, brand new glass and concrete buildings, where some people were making fortunes in the booming economy that is there for part of Africa. And yet almost next door were areas of terrible poverty where people live cramped together in inhumane conditions. And the same people who go to church on a Sunday are the people who go to those offices and who work in factories and who are looking for work in the slums. But is there a connection between these different parts of their lives? As I looked out on this scene, there in front of me was a river flowing through Nairobi, a river that was full of rubbish and plastic and waste and pollution, a sign of what has happened all over the world to God's creation, the environment that we live in. And the big question that my friend posed to me was this, if Jesus Christ is going to be Lord at all, then shouldn't Jesus Christ be Lord of all? That's the scope of the gospel. It's not just about a ticket, a ticket to heaven, it's about what we do in all of our lives. Our attitude to business, our attitude to race and ethnicity, our attitude to gender, and our attitude to the environment, this creation that we're part of. And in this talk, I want to go through the big picture of the Bible from the book of Genesis right through to the book of Revelation in five great themes. I'm going to do this quite quickly. The first time I understood this, it really transformed my understanding of the scope of God's work and the scope of the gospel and the scope of our faith as Christians. So five acts, creation, fall, Israel, Jesus and the new creation. The first of those acts is, of course, creation. When God makes all that we see and even the things that we can't see from the tiniest particles the tiniest submolecular parts of this creation right through to the distant galaxies the whole universe all of it breathed into existence by our creator god and we're told in genesis that when god looked at what he had made he said it is good it is good it is good and then after the sixth day, when he had completed all that he had made, he said, it is all very good. Material things are blessed, are very good, because God made them. They're covered, if you like, in God's fingerprints. And we as human beings are placed within this extraordinary and very good creation with a particular calling, a special vocation, in order to care for, and to steward and guard the creation that God has made. That's the world that we're in, and that's our task. And then if we move through to the second act, the fall, we see that's when things start to go wrong, and it happens very quickly. It happens in our relationship with God, our relationship with our neighbours, and our relationship with the earth. When the first human being, Adam, is thrown out of the garden, he is told, cursed is the soil, the ground, because of you. And the Hebrew word for soil is Adama, 
it's the same root word as the name of the first human, Adam. We, our relationship with the stuff from which we are made has been spoiled and broken because of sin itself. And we see throughout the scriptures that as we mess up our relationships with God and each other, it has an environmental impact as well. And so in the book of Hosea, the people of Israel are told that because of their idolatry, because of their immorality, because of their injustice, that the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are dying and the land mourns. You see, our sin, our broken relationship with God has an impact throughout this world. Creation continues to be good. God continues to care for it. But our relationship with the environment, as well as our relationship with God, has been broken and spoiled. And yet, of course, God doesn't leave it there. And that moves us on to the third act, the land, Israel. And the word Israel, of course, is both a people and it's a place. And the connection between those two is an intimate one within the Bible. In fact, it has been said that the Bible does not know a relationship with God that is separate from your relationship with the land. And certainly that was true of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. God took a chosen people and put them in a promised land, which was the context for their relationship with God. And God gave them lots of instructions about to how to live well in the land, how to do their farming, their religious life, their festivals, their practices, their Sabbath and their Jubilee were tied up with how they farmed and how they cared for the land. And this relationship between land and people, between the places where God has planted us and our relationship with God, is something we're going to look at in some of the future talks during this conference. So creation, blessed by God, very good. Fall, the mess we have made of God's world and our relationship with it. Israel, the fact that our relationship with the places where God puts us matter and are part of our relationship with God. And then of course, we move to the New Testament and to the coming of Jesus. Jesus who was there before all creation, as we're told in the book of Colossians, by and for him all things were made. So the whole creation finds its purpose and its meaning in Jesus. He is the one we're told in whom all things hold together. And when he comes to this earth, he comes to restore the relationships that are broken by the fall. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he restores our broken relationship with God, but also our relationships with each other and our relationship with the earth. Jesus is the new Adam, the new son of the soil, and he restores that broken relationship too. It's so important that we understand this. When Jesus died on the cross, creation itself reacted. There was uh, an earthquake and the tombs became open. There was an eclipse and the sky became dark as creation reacted th to the death of the one by and for whom all things were made. And then when Jesus rose again, there was another earthquake as the stone rolled away. Because these were cosmic events. These were literally earth shattering events. The beginning of the renewal and the restoration of the whole of creation. And that moves us quickly onto the fifth act, which I've called new creation. Now we may think that new creation is something that doesn't happen until after Jesus returns at the end of time, but no, new creation started on Easter day. It started when that broken dead body of Jesus was transformed and rose again to new life. The risen body of Jesus is the first fruits of the new creation. And so we're already living in the new creation, not in its fullness, of course, but in the start of it, 
the beginning of it. Jesus' risen body is our best picture of what heaven is going to be like, of what the new creation is going to be like. And what we find is that the risen body of Jesus was physical. So his disciples, when they doubted, could actually reach out and touch, feel the scars from the wounds that he had. The risen body of Jesus was the same body as had been laid in the tomb. The empty grave clothes were left behind because this was the same Jesus. And yet, it was a transformed body as well. He could appear in a locked room suddenly. Uh, he could appear suddenly at a lakeside. And of course, he could ascend up to heaven in this new risen, perfected body. And that idea that there was both discontinuity and continuity between the dead body of Jesus and his risen body is our best clue about what new creation is like. There's so much about this world that needs to be changed, that needs to be transformed. If in the new creation, we're going to find that every tear is wiped away, that there's no more death, no more suffering, then there needs to be a radical transformation. And yet there's also continuity. And there's a wonderful Greek word, kainos, that the New Testament always uses when it talks about new creation, when it talks about our new life in Christ. And it's, this word kainos doesn't mean brand new, never seen before. It means renewed, restored, redeemed, repaired, or as I often like to say, recycled. The new creation is the old creation that God made very good, but has been damaged, now recycled, repurposed and made new again. So when Jesus uh, in the book of Revelation says, behold, I am making everything new. It's that word kainos again, new. New in its character. Just like we become new creations in Christ when we're born again. And so this big picture from creation to new creation helps us understand that the purposes of God are much bigger than individual salvation. And so my closing challenge at the end of this first talk is to ask you, how big is your Jesus? Do you have a Jesus who, if you like, is a, a pocket-sized personal saviour, who is there to save you and rescue you from your sins? Or do you have a Jesus who is saviour of the world? who is the one who created everything, through whose death everything is being reconciled to God, as Colossians puts it, and through whose resurrection we find that everything is being made new. This big picture that the Bible gives us of God's purposes doesn't make our individual roles less important, it actually makes them more important because God calls us to work with him, to be his co-workers, his partners in caring for his creation.